All right, folks, now that we've got the recording started, um, we're going to go ahead and start on today's guest lecture. Um, really quickly, just to introduce myself, my name is Vikram. I'm RISE's Chief Academic Officer. I work with a lot of our subject matter experts, uh, professional advisors, and so on to help put together these programs uh, that this course is a part of. This is, of course, the guest lecture for application development. And we are joined today by uh, Jack O'Brien. Jack is a former engineer from IBM and Google and has started his own company called OnePager, which is a fundraising and hiring resources resource for startups. Um, Jack is gonna talk through his background, his experience, the lessons he's learned, what he thinks goes into a successful development career, as well as the, the kind of relevant Um, to your careers, and um, we'll be taking questions at the end here. Um, so, Jack, thank you so much for showing up, and I'll go ahead and hand you the mic. Definitely. Thanks. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. All right, perfect. Everyone can see the screen? We can see it. Perfect. All right, let's let's jump into it then. Um, I'm Jack. Thanks for the intro. And um, as I'll I'll say a couple times throughout this chat, um, you know, you can follow me on Twitter at the Jack O'Brien, and please reach out to me um, via email. Um, one of the biggest pieces of advice I can give is that anyone who's really working in tech, and a lot of people that I've worked with, are really open to you know helping people. Uh, jump the barrier and get into the tech world. Um, so seriously, reach out to me. This is my new email at one pager. Um, and if you reach out to me, you know, happy to provide other resources or bits of information from this talk, um, definitely reach out. So before we get started, this is a chart that I was shared with, um, shared with me right when I was uh, started working at Google. And it's the competence versus competence graph. And I think about this all the time, right? And it's, it's one of the reasons I love working in tech so much because there's so many new tools. Um, there's so many new frameworks and languages and things out there in the world um, that you jump into something and immediately you think like, this is amazing. This is such a great tool. You know, I learned this so quickly, um, but then very, you know, after just a short amount of time, you pretty much realize that there's a lot more things that you didn't realize you know, and you kind of enter into that trough of, oh, wait a second, I really don't know a lot about this thing. Um, and then it can be you know, difficult in the part where people get caught up in learning to code or learning anything about technology is going up that slope on the other side and going from you know, average to expert. Um, once you've realized that you don't know a lot, but then you know, moving into that world of, okay, I actually do know a lot about this subject. Um, so my overall advice is really keep in mind that this graph, that when you first learn something, it's fun and exciting because you can pick it up quickly. And then you realize, okay, there's a lot I don't know. And then, um, you know, slowly over time, uh, you, you'll actually become pretty good at the thing you're working on. And this kind of has informed my whole um, definitely life and then the couple jobs I've gone through. But um, so I'm going to do a broad overview of several topics, um, really mainly touching on my career path, um, starting from college and then the, the jobs I had at IBM, um, the job I had at Google, and now this new um, business I've started with my friend a couple of months ago. Um, I'll compare the roles, you know, big companies versus small companies, um, sort of what the different priorities of these jobs are, the scope of work for each of those jobs. And then I think most importantly for everyone, you know, which, what I wish I had known earlier. Um, and I think, this whole thing will be relevant for anyone who's looking into non-technical roles. I'll touch on consulting, uh, product management, biz dev, um, but also very relevant for technical roles. Um, you know, software engineering. I was a software engineer for the majority of these jobs. Um, you know, design work, um, product management sort of falls into both categories. All right, we're well, getting started. Um, we've touched on it a couple times, but my career path so far. Um, was really in college, I was a computer science major. There was this battle of how do you break into tech? Um, I eventually worked at IBM in the consulting group there. 
um, then moved over to Google where I was a software engineer and tech lead for a team. And then finally today, um, one pager, which is this new business. Um, so for a brief background, I grew up in Virginia outside of DC. I always loved you know, science and technology classes and wanted to be a biology or physics major. Um, but when I showed up at college, I took a computer science class and switched my major to computer science. And I think the important thing to take away from this is I did not learn to code until college. Um, you know, you hear stories of kids starting in high school or, um, you know, even earlier. And I didn't do any of that. It, it was a disadvantage at first because a lot of people go into college learning, already knowing how to code um, or even graduate right without knowing how to code. But I didn't learn how to code until college and I, I really liked it. And one of the main reasons is because coding is just awesome. I, I think it's really great. This is one of the first projects we did um, in school. And it sounds like you all are building something similar, maybe a little bit more practical. Um, this is basically just, you know, a, a Java block of code that makes, you know, the planets spin around each other. But I remember building this and thinking, this is really, really cool. I think I can, um, you know, put my, put my life into learning this or at least you know my first job um but what i found was the first internship was really difficult um and here's sort of a wall of all these companies that i applied to but didn't get the job um a lot of these you know didn't even return my calls or resumes and i think the majority of these actually i did interview with but didn't get the role um and google's on there right i ended up working there but um applied in college didn't get there um, Airbnb, Microsoft, um, a couple of startups here, DraftKings. Um, and really, the point is, it's just, it's really difficult um, to get that first job. Um, and I think I went into it thinking that you can just major in computer science and be all right. But the key takeaway here is that um, coding interviews are hard and you have to practice specifically for those coding interviews. Um, and it takes targeted practice. And then something else, I went into these interviews without having done, you know, sort of a side project or something to talk about in the interviews. And something that I found applying to a lot of technology companies is, you know, your schoolwork and your resume gets you in the door, but the majority of the conversation is about, you know, different specific projects that you'd worked on. Um, and I hadn't really done a project like that before. Um, so I, I will emphasize this again and again, but it's important to, you know, learn the fundamentals of computer science and you know coding um, but also just work on something in your own time or in class and have a project that you can talk about i'm sure if you haven't gotten this advice before you'll get it um, but it is it is important to do and so my big takeaway yeah, is is make something um, and you know if you're going into a technical role you know you want to be a software engineer or you know have coding be a large part of your job i would definitely recommend you know, building a personal website, making a side project, you know, a web app, uh, an app on your phone. Um, if you're a non-technical person just looking to get into technology, you can go out and build a low code, no code app. Um, and this will stand out in the interviews, especially before the first job. And if you're looking for, you know, a little bit of inspiration, um, if you, if anyone's heard of these sites, um, Product Hunt, is one that I check all the time. It's, it's a really good place for inspiration to see what people are building. Um, and then Hacker News is another one, which is run by the incubator Y Combinator. And they have, you know, a lot of good just articles and, and you know, you can read through the comments and just get a sense for what's going on in the, the sort of tech world. Um, so definitely recommend looking into these for inspiration, but overall, you know, just get making something because that will end up being just a large part of your conversation in these interviews. Um, so here's an example. Here was my then side project that really helped me um, get my foot in the door for some of these jobs. Um, it was a really basic app where you, you filled out this form and how much you ate um, and, you know, how long you showered and different things like that. And it gave you a, a score for your carbon footprint and how much water you consumed. Um, you know, these were all four screens. It took me several months to make, but it was, it turned out to be an excellent point of, you know, conversation for interviews. And eventually I, I was able to get the job at IBM. Um, granted, I still was struggling with coding interviews because I hadn't committed to actually, you know, whiteboard coding or practicing coding. Um, but during this interview, I got my interviewer to actually download my app and use it. And later he told me, 
you know, you got the job because of that application. I thought it was really interesting. Um, so something to keep in mind, it definitely helps you stand out from the crowd. Um, and for a technical role, right, just go build something from scratch. It doesn't matter what it is. And for a non-technical role, um, you can go out and just, just get experience building something. Um, Cause that's really the core um, of what you'll be doing in your job. And that's, that's what people will find interesting. Um, so at IBM, uh, my job was in blockchain and I was in their blockchain consulting group. And basically what we did was we would go into these fortune 500 companies um, of all different sizes, um, you know, I guess some were smaller and build them proof of concept blockchain apps. And this is, you know, blockchain has been around for a couple of years. Um, IBM had secured several patents and was contributing this open source project. And our goal was to go to companies and show them, you know, the promise of this, this new technology. Um, so we did a project for FedEx. We did a project for the state of Delaware. I think one of the more interesting ones was McDonald's where we did this thing where we tracked, you know, patties from, you know, all the way from, you know, basically the farm to restaurants um, on the blockchain to make sure that, you know, burgers were still, uh, you know, they weren't expired or anything like that. Um, and these were all great projects. And that's one of the great things about working for IBM and the consulting group was it's really project-based work. So I got to work with a lot of different companies, a lot of different tools. Um, our team was mostly remote, um, some based out of New York, and it was really great getting that kind of remote experience, which proved to be really you know, useful a couple of years later. Um, but what did I actually do at IBM every day? I would say it's probably 30% meetings and project planning. Um, there was a good amount of design um, internally and with the client. And those are really exciting. You know, we're in a room together determining what this new technology is going to look like. Um, and then, you know, 10% preparing those final presentations or looking for the next project. And then the vast majority still, you know, building and testing on um, the actual thing that we were working on. Uh, I'll, I'll highlight the design thinking sessions were really great. Um, it was basically, you, you would bring together a full team, um, you know, the client we were working with, our whole team, engineering, design, um, you know, different business people. And then those sessions are really exciting and, and just a good thing to be a part of. And that's, I, th I think just something we look forward to, whether you're, you're gonna be a coder, you're gonna be a product manager, or you're gonna be a biz dev person related to the project. Um, there's these moments where, you know, you bring the whole team together. And I think those are, those are really great. Um, eventually I wanted to leave IBM, um, right? I had been hired as a consultant, but was doing more and more development work um, and had kind of committed to the fact that I wanted to be an engineer. Um, and the blockchain technology we were working with wasn't what I had hoped for. It was a great time for tech hiring like it is today. I would say, you know, today is an excellent time to get into tech as tech is exploding, especially, you know, expedited by, by COVID. Um, and I had always wanted to work at Google after being denied now two times. Um, I had applied there twice. So finally, um, you know, I interviewed for my third time. Um, I got a, a piece of uh, like whiteboard that I taped onto my wall and practiced coding interviews. Um, and after really putting in the time and practicing, um, was finally able to, you know, pass a coding interview um, and get the job at Google. So I worked there for three years as a software engineer and tech lead. Um, coming from IBM, this blockchain team, I started by working in a series of finance projects um, that were internal to Google and then spent um, a good amount of time on the Google search team. And the thing I'm most proud of having built there is this um, math solver. Um, during COVID, we saw a lot of students trying to use Google for math and Google was basically broken for math. If you typed in, um, you know, a minus sign, it would actually ignore whatever came after the minus sign because that's how the search works. You know, you can negate terms. Um, and we built this math solver. So if you type in a math equation, it'll pop up in the Google search form. And that was, you know, the project that we were able to launch. And now, you know, thousands and thousands of students use this every day. And it's, it's a, it's a, it was a really great project to be a part of. So Google every day, you know, I probably spent the majority of my time, right, building, testing, actually deploying code. Um, Google has a great culture of reviewing code and there's this huge, you know, anything that you submit has to be reviewed by one other person. So you spend a lot of time 
um, you know, looking over other code. And I think that really helped me learn, you know, best practices and, and seeing what, what's really, what are all these smart people around me doing? Um, and then separately, 20% probably learning, um, reading documentation, talking with other engineers, 10% um, designing, and then 10% meetings. You know, there's always, there's always going to be those meetings at, at bigger companies. And that number actually might have gotten bigger and bigger as I moved to those larger teams. Um, I think also it's important to say I was an interviewer at Google. So I interviewed uh, 50 plus people who were applying to be software engineers at Google. Um, and those would be coding interviews, um, mostly online, especially after COVID, um, but some in the office on a whiteboard. And the overall criteria to keep um, in your mind is these categories were virtually equally weighted and there was technical ability, right? How good are you actually at coding? Like you said, you were, um, you know, your general knowledge, so that's ability to kind of perform um, in ambiguous situations. Um, there's leadership, um, which that one's a little bit harder to gauge, um, but are you, you know, do you have past experience of leading teams or do you have past experience of, you know, technical ownership on your own, you know, making your own decisions? And then finally, they had this, you know, broad term called Googliness, which was basically how, um, you know, are you are you willing to, you know, take criticism and adapt to a team um, and really be a team player within within a group. Um, and then finally, that leads me to starting one pager. Um, so this started off as a side project with a friend, and we launched on Product Hunt, that site I had talked about um, earlier. And we sort of slowly gained traction for about nine months um, until we reached a point where we had a good amount of companies using the software and we're, we're pulling in, you know, not enough really revenue to pay ourselves good salaries, but enough that it was worth making the jump. Um, and I, I quit my job in July to work on this full time. Um, this is our one page logo. We used to have be something called uh, Open Scout, which was led us to the idea of one pager in this is our old logo. But now I'm just gonna go through a series of just screenshots because I think it's easier to show you the app than, than tell you about it. Um, this is our landing page. You can get there at, at onepager.vc um, and we're basically one link to put all your company's data behind one link and then share it with investors and, and new hires. Um, this is what a public facing one pager looks like, you know, basic company info. Um, what the feature our users really like is you can upload a pitch deck and then, you know, track how far people viewing the deck get into it when they're viewing it. Um, this is what our analytics page looks like. So you can see, you know, how many people have viewed your information over the past couple of days. And then for specific people, you know, how far they've gotten into the site um, or have they clicked on certain links. And then finally, we just have a product to bring together um, a series of these one pagers in one place. And I put a link down here. Um, one page .bc slash board slash investor day we call this boards um and i think it's we we update this weekly with some of the best companies that sign up on our platform and if anyone's interested i think it's a good place to go and just see what just get a look for new companies that are being formed um you know companies come to our platform we put them on here it's just a good place to see really early stage companies if you're interested in, in that sort of thing so what do I do every day at one pager now? Um, I would say every day is different. You know, majority of my time is spent building the application and fixing bugs. Um, but there's also this, this, you know, pretty much having to do everything else because we don't have a big team supporting us like I have at these other, at the, the other companies, right? Um, so that's, you know, collecting data, there's talking to users, investors, advisors, um, doing our recruiting. Um, and that both means, you know, we've worked with a series of freelancers um, and we also have another you know, developer on our team that I manage now. Um, and then also there's a good chunk of writing blog posts and, uh, you know, putting content out there in the world. And that's both to improve our SEO, right? So that we our, our website shows up in Google, but it's, and it's sort of free marketing. Um, so now I'm just going to go through all of these um, experiences I've had and just compare and contrast them a little bit. Because I, I do think they are, it's all, it's all tech experience and there's, a lot of different routes you can go to get into tech and then there's a lot of different trade-offs for what you decide to do within the industry. Um, the first one is team size, clearly. You know, IBM and Google are massive companies. Um, one pager is a three-man team where I'm the only engineer. IBM, I worked on small teams. 
you know, it was this consulting groups, three to four, um, you know, engineers really with maybe a couple of people supporting us. Google was anywhere from three to four to search. You know, we were a 15 person team within a thousand person team that builds search. Um, and I think the biggest takeaway here is that the, the bigger team, there's more what I would call organizational overhead. Um, and that means, you know, every decision needs to be approved by more people. Um, you know, your code needs to be approved more. Every, you need to move closer to perfection because more users are actually using your stuff. Um, and then the trade-off, right, is you don't have as many people to learn from as a, as a one-person team, um, but you can move a lot quicker. And that, I, th I think both sides to it are valuable. It's, it's valuable to learn from other people. It's also valuable to, you know, be pushing out work and, and trying things out. Compensation is, is clearly different. You know, Google and IBM established companies, one pager, it's, it's uncertain where our future is going to go. And, and the basic premise rate is the more established the company, the steadier the income. Um, but I think there's a gray area in here that I would definitely recommend everyone um, look into for tech jobs. And those are, you know, venture backed or rising companies that aren't quite fully established. Um, you know, there's a risk reward curve that if you can get into something that fits your risk appetite and is maybe not fully established, um, you know, there, there's a lot of upside there. And there's there's a ton of opportunities across tech that are looking for jobs right now. Um, so then there's job focus, and this varied at every company too. Um, at IBM, you know, it was, it was consulting and project-based. So these were quick, quick hitting projects, you know, two to three months. Um, at Google, it was, you know, a heavy engineering focus and product-based. And that's, you know, you're working on a single product that is going to live for multiple years. Um, and then at one page, you're right, there's do, do sort of everything, um, but it's, it's product-based too, right? We're working on one product. And I would say that the big difference between project and product is, you know, project leads to more exposure and you work on more things, you know, that could be freelancing or working on, um, you know, consulting jobs, um, but product leads to more depth and, you know, you work with the same team on the same product for a long time. Um, and there's pros to cons to each, but it's really, you know, what, if you're going to work on a specific product, I definitely recommend being interested in that product. Um, and project is maybe a better place to start if you're, you know, you don't know you want to work in tech, but you're not sure exactly what you want to work on. And then there's the driving force behind work, right? So with IBM, we were completely driven by clients. You know, you pretty much have to do what the client tells you at Google. And I think this is really interesting and a lot of tech companies do this, but they are completely metrics driven. Um, when you're using Google search or using YouTube or using even Gmail, you're part of an experiment and there are certain features turned on for you that aren't turned on for other users. And if those features perform well, they'll make it into the product. And Google's kind of this giant science experiment. And so are a lot of other tech companies, especially ones that are really big. Um, and those are metrics driven. So, you know, Things only get pushed out to users, or at least all users, if they provide good metrics. And that makes it really interesting because you, you pretty much know that the product is going in the right direction, um, but it can hurt you know, your ability to actually do good work or push out changes quickly because you have to be metrics driven. And that, that more happens when you have a ton of users, um, but we're trying to implement some of those things at one page now with a small, you know, smaller set of users. And then one pager though, our, our main driver is really finding this product market fit, which if you, you know, talk with enough startups, um, it's finding, you know, where your product fits in, what's your wedge into the economy. And our, um, we're, we're trying to find that and we're working hard, but it's more, it's more about finding that wedge than it is about, you know, making all of your clients happier, being directed by any one particular client or metric. Um, and so the, these three, you know, driving forces vary tremendously, um, and can, you know, basically just affect your day-to-day -day job. And and it's important to sort of think about this before you commit to any one job. And then finally, uh, you know, tech stacks. Um, so these companies, they all varied in tech stack. With IBM, we're working with specific partners, and you work with kind of whatever the client builds on, plus open source and you know proprietary IBM technologies. Um, Google is, you know, they have a ton of proprietary internal technologies plus some open source, you know, languages. And then um, 
one pager, we mostly use open source tools and um, you know other tools that we've chosen. And the, the big takeaway here is the bigger the company, the more proprietary their tech is. And what that means is, you know, even Google, which seems really forward facing on the outside, um, you know, they were built on technologies in 2000, right? And it's, it's a long process to migrate from, from those to something else. And I guess the key takeaway is working at a big company, you're going to have to use potentially older technologies or get used to the way of doing things internally. And those don't necessarily transfer to other companies. Um, or if you work for a smaller company or maybe a newer company, um, you, know, you use more open source tech, um, more you know, best tools of the day. And that gives you a little bit of mobility between companies. Um, but overall, languages, tools, frameworks, um, you can't go wrong with learning anything. Um, you know, any well-supported framework is used by you know, thousands of companies. Um, this is an overview of some of the stuff that I've encountered you know, different languages. I think, I think this class is mostly taught using Django and Python. So that's something I encountered actually a bunch at IBM, um, but also obviously HTML, CSS, JavaScript, TypeScript, C++, all the different cloud providers, um, you know, definitely learning GitHub and Git, um, getting used to SQL databases, no SQL databases. You, you really can't go wrong learning any tech stack and any major company will use a combination of all of these different tools or, um, you know, by learning one tool in depth, they're all, you know, based from the same family tree of languages and, and structures and mental models. Um, so you really can't go wrong. It's really, I would just recommend learning whatever you're working on, um, learn it really, really well. Um, and then finally, here's um, just a wrap up of sort of what I wish I knew. Um, and I think college is a major leg up in applying to the tech world, but it's not a guarantee, um, right? My, my biggest um, moment there was applying to all these companies and them saying, yeah, this is great, but you actually don't know how to pass a coding interview, so you're not gonna get this job. Um, and I've worked with at a lot of jobs, you know, the majority of people have some sort of computer science background maybe 60 or so percent, but a lot are self-taught online. A lot went to coding boot camps, um, and a lot studied something completely different in college, right? But then ended up in the tech world. And that means as an engineer or as, you know, a product manager or designer or someone in biz dev related to the products I've worked on. Um, and I, I really wasn't taught practical coding in college, right? And I think the key takeaway is you need to learn a lot of those skills on your own. And that means, you know, working on side projects, um, you know, creating a GitHub, getting used to what's, um, what different tools are out there on the web. And then um, I think people really are willing to help. So if you reach out to, you know, reach out to me, I have my email at the beginning of this slide at the, of this deck. Um, reach out to people at specific companies for roles that you're interested in. Um, and people will respond if you give them a reason to. And that means, you know, showing that you're interested in exactly what they're working on. Uh, maybe linking to some sort of, you know, thing you've seen on GitHub or article you've read, or maybe write something yourself. Um, if you give people a reason to respond, they're, they're definitely willing to help out. And then I would just recommend getting on Twitter and following people in the tech world and, and just knowing what all the new, um, you know, tools and products and things that are out there. Um, one of the uh, advice I got from a mentor at IBM was to start listening to, um, you know, tech podcasts. And I, first started doing it and I didn't even really know what they were saying, but you listen to it enough and, and you start to understand the jargon and it can really be a great way to make yourself, you know, both seem like a more legitimate engineer and then eventually you actually become one. <laughs> um, and then finally, this is just a couple things that I think are interesting today that I wish I were around when I was sort of in college or, or high school. Uh, the first one is just MetaMask. If you haven't heard of this, it's, it's, a Chrome extension that is your connection into, you know, Ethereum and, and the modern day web three. Um, and I would just recommend looking this up, watch their video, download MetaMask, check out some web three sites. I'm not an expert on, you know, Ethereum or, or NFTs or anything like that, but I think it's a really interesting tool that's going to be around for a long time and it's worth checking out. Um, the second one here is Battlesnakes, which is a website 
um, I found at Google and actually competed with some of the, the people I worked there with. And you basically develop a little server that then you pre-code in, you know, based on a board where your snake should go. If you think about that game snake and you play against other snakes and it's a really great just, you know, website for competition, you could practice coding. Um, it's absolutely something you could talk about in a coding interview. Um, and I definitely recommend checking it out. And then finally, there's this website, Replit, which I'm not sure if um, you know you all have even used as part of this course, but it basically allows you to code in your browser. And I think it's a really good way to get up and running um, quickly. You know, working on on coding projects. Um, there's a lot of great templates. Um, if you search online, there's there's people explaining how to use Replit. Um, but I would say you know these three tools are just things that I find really interesting, um, and I wish had been around. And I think they're, they're a good place to start. So I've covered kind of a broad span of things, but, but want to open it up for questions for everyone. And it sounds like we have some pre-submitted questions. That's right. Um, Jack, first of all, thank you so much for going through that. Um, that was some really great information. And I think one of the interesting things for me was, despite the fact that I'm very non-technical, hearing a lot of your more general and career-focused advice and, and having that resonate with my experience as well. So that was very interesting to hear. Um, so just to quickly jump in here um, with some of the questions from our, from our students here. Um, first one is essentially a, a two-parter about one pager, and that is what inspired you to create one pager or uh, or your co-founder or whoever came up with the idea and how do you actually go through the process of taking an idea and turning it into a product and getting people behind it and i know that's a that's a massive question obviously but is, you know at, at at least a high level i i think it's a really good question though because you you see online, you know, all the people talking about, oh, just get started, just do your idea, and, and how you come up with that idea, and how you, you know, solve the chicken and egg problem. How do you get people using your thing if your thing needs people to be using it to be successful? Are, are really core questions to the whole process. So, to answer the first one, um, so my co-founder and I, um, we actually had started a company in college together, also, and it was completely non-technical. Um, we had seen kids at another school uh, rent mattresses to the school, basically. And, and we would, you know, they would move in a big bed and move out whatever twin beds were in the dorm. And they would make, you know, they would make money off the, the move in, move out and storage. And so we saw that in another school and thought, okay, we can do that at our school. So we built this business and eventually, you know, we started our junior year in college. By our senior year, we were doing 300 beds um, you know, move in, move out and storage. Um, and it was just a great experience. We set up a website, we bought beds in bulk as if we were at a hotel, which allowed us to buy them cheaply. Um, and we loved, you know, building this business. And the way we started that business was really just saying, hey, those guys are doing it. We can do this, you know, and we can do it, we think better. Um, when we graduated school, my friend continued working on the business and I wanted to go get you know, tech experience, because I knew this is really what I wanted to be working. I didn't want to be hauling, hauling beds, which was, we were hauling a lot of beds ourselves. Um, and he went out eventually, and, and we had our school, we, we had grown to two other schools um, to look for venture funding and found it really, really difficult. And eventually, you know, he was able to raise a little bit of money, but then it's just a really difficult business to scale. We're talking about, you know, moving and storage and, and you're dealing with all these different college politics. Um, so we eventually sold the business or, you know, a generous sale to, to another company that was rolling up some of these bed rental companies, but had the idea that, you know, this is a good business. If we had been able to raise money to grow it, um, we should go out and try and make it easier for people to start businesses and raise money. And that was sort of the original idea behind one pager. Um, one pager was going to be a, a network of, you know, founders and investors. And we matched them based on, you know, shared ideas rather than warm introductions or just, you know, your backgrounds. 
And we found that idea to be really difficult to implement, kind of a two-sided platform. But founders seemed to like our tool. And then we invested, you know, all of our time into developing the founder side and eventually ended up with this, you know, growing presentation tool. So I think I think a couple things that are wrapped up in that story are, you know, we just sort of started building things based on our personal experience. And then once we started doing it, we realized, you know, okay, our original idea isn't, we didn't have some, you know, moment of this is an amazing idea. Um, we just started building the thing and then realized, you know, okay, we need to focus on this one part of it. Um, and even today, right, we have this fundraising tool um, that works really well and companies are really happy about it, but we're having troubles growing the tool fast enough. And there's some other avenues that we're looking into going down, um, you know, to work on our expansion and, and growth of the tool. And I guess, you know, the, the, to wrap all that up, basically what I'm saying is it comes down to finding a person you want to work on projects that you really trust. Um, I was lucky to have that with, with the person that I've known now for eight years. Um, and then just starting building something that you're interested in and continuing to focus on what people like most about the product or service or whatever you're offering. Um, and that's, that's a really hard question to answer. Um, but we're, we're trying to do it. And I think, you know, people have done it over and over again. Um, and we'll either come out of this with a, with a good sustainable business or, you know, a very good experience. <laughs> for, for sure. So just kind of transitioning to the next question here. Obviously, uh, you've kind of highlighted the fact that programming and, prog and uh, software development and the tech around it is constantly evolving how as a, this has always been a, a massive fascination of mine as well but how as a developer do you stay on top of the changes in programming languages and standards and, and all of that really really good question um and this is one of those you know the confidence versus confidence graph that i always think back to and when you first get into programming you learn your one language or one tool really really well and then you realize oh crap, the world is so big and there's always new things and it's a moving target to stay up to speed. Um, and I guess my main advice on that is really just to whatever you're working on and learning, um, learn that piece of code and frameworks and tools really, really well. Um, and everything's interconnected. So eventually, you know, by learning one specific language, one specific, you know, framework, you'll know a lot about that language and framework, but you also understand the shortcomings of it and look for how to fill those gaps. Um, and that'll lead you naturally to exploring other tools, I would say. And it's not something that, you know, you can do overnight, but it really just comes down to building competence in one specific thing. And then when you're going off and building, you know, a project on your own or a side project, or, or like we did eventually starting a business, the answer isn't really to build whatever with whatever is the next newest, coolest thing. It's really just to build with what you really know well. And so that's why learning something really, really well is more important because at the end of the day, you want to build an app that people use and people don't care if it's built on the newest, coolest stuff. You know, there's like basically every modern website today is built on old tech, right? Um, and any apps that come out are, are built, some of them are built on newer stuff. Um, but it comes down to when you're building something, you just want to build with what you know, what you know well, because it's all about getting things out there in front of people and, and learning and right shifting your idea. Um, so I would say it's, it's a moving target. And one of the hardest things is just accepting the fact that you're never going to know it all. <laughs> it's always going to be moving. Um, and it's good to just learn something. I would say go for depth over breadth. Definitely. That makes a ton of sense. Thank you. And then just one more of the pre-submitted before we open the floor here. Um, obviously, software development is a very collaborative field. So what have you learned about best practices for working with teams to complete big projects, um, both in terms of sort of an interpersonal and just like a general team management strategy sense, as well as anything in terms of actual project management tools you found to be really helpful? Definitely. Um, 
So I'll say, yeah, virtually everything I've worked on is very collaborative, um, very team-based. I think that's one of the big, big differences going from, you know, college academic work into actual coding is, you know, a lot of, at least my college academic work, I assume it's similar with this course, is you're building something um, from scratch, maybe with a team also from scratch, um, whereas virtually everything else you'll hop into, you're, you're walking into a code base that is, you know, extensive and been around for years and possibly been through multiple migrations um, with a bunch of people who know a lot of info and maybe haven't documented that info well. Um, and I'll say, I, I remember reading something recently that the people who are best at coding show great signs of having really good communication skills and really good writing skills, not necessarily correlated with math, like you would think. Um, and I think that comes down to the fact that it's it's just an extremely collaborative process. And a lot of it is about communicating with your team um, and then, you know, writing documentation or, or, you know, even just emails or notes to be able to pass on to your team and have, you know, a project that you can all work on together. Um, you know, concrete tools and steps you can you can go for to, to actually like start building a collaborative team and a collaborative collaboratively built project. Um, absolutely, go learn Git. Um, you know, get a GitHub, learn Git. Those are just baseline skills that are necessary. Different companies will have different version control systems and ways to merge or, or work with code, um, but it all comes down to the same you know paradigm of. I'm pulling down the code base and working on my piece. And then at some point I'm gonna to need to merge in my piece with another person's you know, work. Um, I think the most successful teams I've been on have given single people a lot of autonomy on their own piece of the project. And then, so then you're not you know, completely overlapping when it's time to, to merge code together. Um, and it also just when a single person right, has a lot of room to run and, and ideas to implement. Um, I think I think that makes a lot better of a system. Uh, but I would say learn Git, learn GitHub. Um, some project management tools I've used. I've really I really like Asana. Asana is what we use at one pager now. Um, Google had all their different internal softwares. Um, GitHub's great. I think Jira is is one, but I haven't really used that. Um, we use Trello at IBM. There, there's a million different pieces of software out there that, that handle, you know, project management and, um, you know, collaboratively work, working with teams. Um, if I had to give one piece of advice, if, you know, you have a team and where you guys are building this app right now, I think in this class, or at least going to, um, it would be to create a sort of board that has here's our backlog, here's things that are currently being worked on, and here's things that are completed. Um, and every person should only be working on one thing in the currently working on column at any one time. And that makes it really easy to collaborate with the team. Um, where it gets sticky is, you know, you have three things in there, but you're only working on one, and then a teammate wants to work on one, and then you forget your place. Um, it can seem like things are going more slowly if you only pick one thing at a time, but I think Focus on projects is really, really important. And context switching between two different things just gets incredibly difficult the more things you stack up. Um, so that was that was a big answer, but I would say, you know, GitHub is great. Gotta learn Git if you're gonna be an engineer. Um, Asana is my favorite product management tool and only work on one thing at one time. I, I think that's that's fantastic advice. Certainly, there's always the the kind of adage, uh, less haste, more speed, right? Um, and certainly, when when your folks is divided, that's the thing that comes up. I also have to say that's the nicest thing anyone has ever said about Jira. I think as a piece of software. I know. I was like, um, I'm just trying to name them. I, I don't like Jira. <laughs> nobody likes Jira. Yeah. Um, you'll probably end up using it at some point, but nobody likes Jira. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Okay, so with that said, I think we've gotten through the pre-submitted questions. So now I'm gonna now we're gonna open the floor and um, students. If any of you have um, questions for Jack, this is a great time to fire away. Um, what coding um, language um, have you found that you've used the most um, in all of your careers? Um, definitely, I think. 
honestly, it's been TypeScript. I've used a lot of TypeScript, both in, um, I've done a lot of front end web development um, at IBM, but then even some of the blockchain work we were doing, I used TypeScript for our servers around that. Um, at Google, um, a lot of the front ends were in TypeScript. Um, so all of Google searches migrating to TypeScript, a lot of the internal stuff I worked on was in TypeScript. And at one pager now, um, you know, our entire front end is in TypeScript um, with React and our back end is actually, it's, it's a Node.js runtime with TypeScript is, is the language we code in mostly. Um, I think it's a, it's a really great language. I think it, it putting up the rails of, of types and things is, is really, really helpful. I don't know if you've encountered that. Um, but then in terms of other languages, I mean, there's, there's a ton of other stuff I've also encountered. Um, a good amount of Python. Um, Google was a, a lot built in C++, um, a lot built in Java. Um, but I would say, yeah, the, the JavaScript TypeScript ecosystem is so big and only growing that that's something I've encountered a lot and definitely plan to keep using. Thank you. What languages are, are you all learning right now? Um, right now we're doing HTML um, and this week we're going to look at SQL a little bit, um, but I've done, I've worked with Python and C++ before. Very cool. Yeah. HTML will be around forever also and it's definitely, you know, just a absolute necessity to learn um, and CSS obviously with that. And then um, SQL, yeah, definitely, definitely SQL is you know, going to be the way that data is structured, I think, for the longer term. Um, and there's lots of different ways to learn SQL, but generally understanding, you know, the mindset of, you know, tables and relationships between those tables is a, a baseline, just excellent skill to have. Any other questions, folks? If the tech world is constantly looking for new hires, why did it take so long for you to break into the tech world? Yeah, I, I think that's a good question. There's, so the tech world right now is just exploding, especially with COVID, right? There's just so much, so many things are moving online. There's so much money flowing into tech from VC and you know these different businesses just expanding. Um, but you really do need to meet that baseline standard of, of skills in order to get the job in the first place. Um, and what that means is, you know, having some sort of project that you can point to and talk about. And that's usually, you know, a side project and can be something from class. Um, but then it's also just getting, you know, passing a coding interview a lot of times. And I think I, I struggled with coding interviews to start because I assumed that the knowledge from my classes would transfer over um, into those coding interviews. And the the truth is you really just have to study for them independently, you know, by taking coding classes and, you know, having experience with code and learning from lectures and things, you'll be so much better off than someone starting from scratch, but you do need to put in time to specifically learn how to pass a coding interview. And it's sort of silly um, that that's the way it works now, but it's just the best way for recruiters to tell, um, you know, if you're someone who can, you know, will be able to hold their own within the company. Um, and yeah, I think it, I honestly, just for me, I didn't, I didn't prepare well enough for those coding interviews. I thought my classes would take me all the way there and they, they didn't. So you just, I would say, you know, practice those coding interviews specifically. And then I think by doing that too, it just made me a lot, a much better programmer too. Um, you know, both writing them, like I would write down the code on a piece of paper I would bring up, you know, my editor and, and have the problem and then solve the problem and make sure it actually ran. And by just doing that practice, um, you know, like anything else you practice, it just, it'll make you better at coding interviews, but that will actually make you better at, you know, programming and, and coding as well. Thank you. Yeah. And there's some good websites too. There's, I'm sure you've heard of, if, if you've ever dipped into this world, um, like Leap Code, I think is one. 
Um, there's a website. I like I used to when I was really into the throes of looking for a, another job, I, I used to get a, like an engineering problem in my mailbox every day, like my email, and then I would try and solve that. And then there was this website online and I, I forget the name of it, but it, they pair you up with other people and you interview them and then they interview you as just practice. And any of those tools are super, super useful. You should be able to find them based on those search terms and stuff. <laughs> Saying anything else? Hey, Jack, uh, thank you for everything you've shared. I've, I've learned a few things today myself from you. Uh, this has been a great experience. I have two questions, if you don't mind, uh, for the class that might be helpful. Can you, for the first one, can you speak to them, uh, your time commitment, like getting into the field um, while in the field? You know, is it a nine to five or an eight to five job? Um, you know, what can they expect? Definitely. Um, so I think it varied from, from job to job. Um, IBM was um, essentially a nine to five, but then we were, you know, it was consulting work, right? So we're working for specific clients. And when it became a crunch time or deadline, um, those would be, you know, long, long nights, you know, for maybe a couple of days in a row. Um, Google was, you know, and I think a lot of other big tech companies really value the work-life balance. And those were basically nine to fives. Um, and really even further than that, um, those teams are really open to working whatever hours that, you know, you were able to get your work done. So I, I had someone on my team who would show up at 11, but then leave at eight o'clock at night, right? Um, and they would just move their hours around. Um, and those are, you know, you're just basically doing the job that, you, you know, in a, it's a big organization um, and just whatever's the best thing, you know, to get the work done for that organization. And then working for one pager now, um, you know, it's we're only getting out of that business what I put into it, and it's it's a lot more hours. <laughs> it's pretty much, you know, if anything breaks, um, you know, I have all these alerts set up, and I'll I'll get a text. Um, if we have we have a whole backlog of features and things we want to try, and that all pretty much needs to be built by me or, or passed on to one of the freelancers we work with through me, um, and that's a lot lot more work. Um, you know, there's, there's different pros and cons that come with all that work, but I think, you know, for the majority of, of tech jobs, it's just such a competitive um, place. You know, once you meet those skills to get in, um, companies try to make it a really good place to work. Um, but then, you know, as you skew more towards the startups, there's, you know, potentially that higher upside, um, but it's a lot, lot more hours. Thanks, Jack. The additional question is, um... I apologize, I had it in front of me here. Um, well, I can't believe I'm blanking on the question. Uh, when you, that's now I know what I wanted to ask you. When you're, um, when you've gotten into a roadblock, right? What have you done? Like, like, what are some strategies when you encounter a problem that's been like, I'm not sure how to solve it. I'm really frustrated. Maybe I, maybe I can't do this, or maybe this isn't for me. How have you kind of been able to uh, get through that? And what are some strategies that might be useful for the students? Yeah, I think that happens. That happens a lot, especially for anyone, anyone who codes. I had I had a friend of mine once say, like, you know, I guess coding really is just you know the ability to hit a roadblock and then just keep pushing through it until you can solve it. Um, and I think there's there's a good deal of you know having patience to be able to deal with those problems will eventually make you, you know, a good technical person. Um, I think it's important first of all to realize that like everyone who is coding goes through these problems no matter no matter your level of experience um, probably unless you wrote the language you're going to run into the problems with languages or problems with the frameworks or problems with your project or even just problems you know that are a little bit higher level of you know is this really for me do I belong here um, and I would say a big part of that is just having patience and realizing that everyone is going through those challenges and then just having um, you know, a broad strategy of how to deal with, you know, for specific engineering problems. Um, 
you know, good places and resources to look to. Um, things you need to get good at are number one, just reading like online documentation is definitely a skill. So being able to, you know, okay, there's a problem with this language, go to that language, look up, you know, what that error is, solve it. Um, looking into Stack Overflow, Stack Overflow, you know, if you've worked in coding at all, you know, is you Google the problem, it's probably the first thing that comes up, that's really useful. Um, asking for help and asking for help in a way that you can get an answer quickly, I think is really important. Um, so that's, you know, if you're working with a team or, or even in a group project, right? Figuring out how to ask your teammates in the best way, it's figuring out how to ask your professor in the best way, figuring out how to ask a, you know, higher level engineer the best way. And what that means is, you know, just how do you ask a question and be able to get an answer more quickly? I think that's really important. Um, but it really, it really comes down to just patience and the ability to experiment. Because a lot of times you'll run into an error that no one really recognizes. And it's probably because you did something earlier on when you were coding or building something that was a little bit weird. Um, and being able to, you know, be comfortable kind of like deconstructing your solution and then, and then trying to rebuild it. And these are things that, that take time and skills to build, but it, it really just comes into patience. Um, and just realize how much you will be able to do if you learn how these things work um, and sort of set that higher level goal of wanting to be, you know, an engineer or wanting to be a product manager. And then when you run into these daily problems, um, it's a lot easier to justify it to yourself that it's worth having the patience to solving them at every step. Jack, thank you so much for your time. Uh, we really appreciate it. We really appreciate having you in class. Um, and that brings us to the end, I think, uh, of our time here. Todd, I don't know if you had anything you wanted to do with the students for the last half hour of class, if so I can just make you host. Otherwise, uh, no, we can wrap just a quick reminder to take part in the discussion around this talk today because a lot of great points. I'd love to hear the feedback from the students uh, and then also to uh, just begin reading over the material around SQL and uh, look over the assignment for the week. And that is all we can wrap. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Thank Jack. You. Perfect. Take care, folks. Have a great week. Thank you.